My background, I'm a, a chemist uh, by training um, and started uh, in my industrial research career with Dow Chemical as a researcher. Um, I have to say throughout my career I've had an extremely diverse range of roles from technical service and development through to new product development, through to global material science and characterization uh, leadership, through to new business development, through to process engineering leadership, through to technology strategy development. So, and the point I make from that is, you, you, starting from a degree, you know, I've built qualifications along the way, but as needed, that suited the different roles and that provided that learning opportunity. Through each of these um, areas, the three things that really stand out as being the skills that underpin um, the ability to transition between each of these different roles. And certainly, uh, some of the chemistry has been as basic as incremental product development in um, existing applications to leading the project for the world's first elastic fibre ma made out of polyolefins. So, new to world materials, new to world applications. And so, there's a very diverse range of roles within the one base uh, credential. And as I said, the, the things that really stand out are the ability and the complexity of the relationships I've worked with across those different roles have been significant. But when you have common and aligned goals and measures and accountability, then those partnerships and relationships um, are much easier to work across because you're all heading in the same direction. You all want to achieve and need to achieve the same outcomes. When you're also working in an area where those relationships are long term, you get that opportunity to build the trust that you need and the credibility in that decision making as you move forward. And then the other one that came in, comes into play is the big picture thinking. So if, you're, if you are looking at a more integrated approach to what you're doing and you're looking upstream and, and downstream for different opportunities, ideas, it creates those better opportunities for partnerships. And the point that I'm trying to make here is there's no reason that those relationships shouldn't or couldn't exist between academia and industry and the challenge is that you have to try and achieve those same alignment of um, strategies, alignment of goals, building those long-term relationships because we're not going to fix this issue overnight, and then also having that bigger picture thinking. And I, I guess to some degree I, I disagree or have a slightly different opinion of the research that should be done in universities, and, and I believe there's an opportunity to do both. If you are building those relationships between industry and academia and those partnerships, there is a greater opportunity for academics to do fundamental research on societal challenges and societal issues that do count. And there'll be some discovery research along the lines as well. And the, the other point that I wanted to say in mentoring PhD students of the current generation, they want to be working on stuff that has impact. They don't want to be working on discovery research to no end, you know, that, that's someone else's curiosity. So I, they're the points that I wanted to make. I think these aren't insurmountable problems that we're trying to address in engaging industry and academia, but we do have a, a number of things to align or fix to be able to get there. Thanks very much. And we'll just hold questions until each of the panellists have done their introductions. So um, please keep notes and come on later. Brett, if you could um, have your few words, thanks. Yeah, um, I found the whole process this morning very challenging, a great opportunity to try and question why I got to where I got to, and I'm still working it out. Um, I did a physio, uh, my PhD was Physiology of Starfish, I've never used it since. Um, what, I was, <laughs> what I was fortunate enough to have was some, uh, some great professors and the opportunity to uh, manage my own research uh, in, a, in a protected and, and supportive environment. And of course, to learn things like uh, computer programming back in the day when you had to write stats programs yourself, um, and uh, and statistics and things like that. So some great core skills which have which have stood me in good stead. Um, I've spent 30 years. Uh, in fact, started my first company while I was still in the PhD lab. Um, so I spent 30 years in and around business. Some of them very very big, some of them very small. And then 15 years ago, left industry outside industry to work for myself in a, in a basically a one-man band. I put together teams of people for different things, but 
interestingly enough, my company's name is Babel, Babel SBF, you know, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the <laughs> Fish in the Ear, and you can, so I'm a translator. <laughs> we talked about translation this morning, so my business has been about translating, which we're going to reflect in something I'm going to say in a minute. But many of my colleagues have likewise been scientists who have worked their entire careers in industry. So I really don't think there's any fundamental issues with science and business. I, I think they are a perfect match. So the question would then have to be, why does it work for some people and not for others? And I think, uh, or, or in, some, in some situations, but not in other situations. So I kind of think, and these are my sort of, uh, you know, key points, I think. Uh, science comms is not something that someone over in the science comms section does for you. That's what you do when you talk to people. And if you're a scientist and you're not good at that, then accept that that's something that you're not going to progress into. Uh, if you want to get good at it, you can. Uh, unfortunately, these days, you know, uh, unless you've got the gift of putting 10 or 14 words and a picture together, you're never going to run IFL science. Some people are very, very good at finding problems and hopeless at finding solutions. And some people are also um, very, very good at finding solutions to their problems, even when you're paying them to find solutions to your problems. <laughs> um, and, and that's, again, that is a cultural thing. It's a mindset thing. You know, you're either determined to do this or you're willing to do that. Um, and the other thing, and I don't want to be controversial here, but is uh, I think there's also issues around you know, integrity in, in, debate, in the debates in our community which involve science and technology. And, and for example, I think scientists are very, very slow to defend their position. For example, some of these uh, you know, issues such as uh, climate change, you know, anti-vax, whatever, you know, we, as scientists we don't tend to step up and, and stomp on arguments which are just absolutely spurious. It's not in our nature. And that allows odd debate, weird debate to happen in the community. It detracts from everybody and it detracts from, from decision making. And, and more importantly, all of these things um, marginalise the role of science in decision making. If you want to know the best way to make a decision these days, buy 100,000 um, subscribers on Facebook and lodge uh, a petition to the minister because you will affect policy change. And it is easy to buy likes on Facebook. So, you know, we've seen some really, really um, um, crazy decisions made in the last year or so which are driven by Facebook likes. I don't know, I'm a marine biologist, I follow things like Abbott Point. The decision to dump material in Cayley wetlands versus the marine park was a decision based around lots and lots of Facebook likes and lots of noise in the social media, which wasn't effectively counted by, by science in the debate. Um, Kathy this morning spoke about vision and the ecosystem um, and the thought that went through my mind was strangely enough exactly like, it was exactly the same one. When I was seven years old, I watched, first time I ever saw TV, the moon landing. I happen to be from a remote rural area. Now, maybe that influenced me, maybe the fact that it was allowed, I was, I was allowed to run around and eat dirt and fall out of trees. But I have a, you know, I obviously had a fairly resilient you know, nature. Um, I, I want to say necessity is not the mother of invention. Leadership is. And you know, helpless people don't invent or innovate, empowered people do. And, and sometimes it is of necessity. Sometimes if you get desperate enough, you will go and, and invent or innovate. But oftentimes, helpless people will just starve. And, and I think that, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of the situation at all, but um, political leadership is key. You know, uh, given the way science has been treated at a national level in the last few years, is it any wonder that scientists feel like they're in the trenches, that they have to keep their heads down, that they have to fight for a small pool of funds? It's a scarcity mentality, not a mentality of plenty. The moonshot speech wasn't given by a vice-chancellor or a CEO or a media mogul or a chief scientist or an industry science partnership. It was given by JFK. And I say the last few weeks has been a period of some optimism, but that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> Thank you. And on that note, um, Peter. Right. Thanks, Ross. Hear from you. Uh, 
My career in, in Rio Tinto is, is 20 years or so. Uh, prior to that, I was a medical scientist before uh, doing a PhD on the fate of copper in marine sediments, in fact, with CSIRO. Uh, the, um, I came on board at that time. The brief from Rio Tinto was the regulations that we face, and I don't mean that as a negative word, um, what is the science basis underneath the regulations that a, a big mining multinational operates under? Can you contribute to that in any meaningful way? And with regulations, we can look at things like license to operate, a license to market. That's at one end of the spectrum, I'd suggest. At the other end of the spectrum is beyond compliance. And responsible industry out there is always striving to do beyond compliance, if possible. I, my work is mainly around Rio Tinto value chains, understanding what I call hotspots. These are the health, safety, environment hotspots along those value chains from, um, from the production sites through to the ports and beyond the ports. So it's about uh, production sites, whether it's a smine or a smelter or whatever, and it's about cargoes on vessels and seeing those to, to market. Uh, time was. Uh, minerals, metals, ca uh, cargoes were marketed on price, reliability of supply and the specification. These days very much so and rightly so, they are marketed on their health, safety and environment credentials. And Jay and Jay would know about that too. Um, so that's the area that I work through um, and in the period I've been with Rio Tinto it has largely been, how can I put it, outside Rio Tinto? because I have a lot of time with our, I spend a lot of time with research community and with the regulatory community and the government. Uh, and um, if there's one key message that emerged for me this morning is that science communication is underdone in Australia. And uh, whether that's the German kindergarten or the primary school or the university or the research institution or industry or government, as Richard Miles referred to, we need to do science communication better. Uh, and I, I tend to think of uh, some comment, comments this morning were around the, the, the one page in the, uh, in the newspaper. That's the public profile. We have a, a burgeoning population of citizen scientists out there now, which is great for them to understand what science is about and how to evaluate science. That's, that's another uh, momentum change that I see happening out there, increased awareness amongst the public of, uh, of what science delivers. Uh, so that science communication thing is there. It certainly um, would have to say there are drivers that are different in this communication context within business compared to academia or research institutions. So what I'd suggest is that the common language, however, between uh, a research institution or university uh, like, um, and business and government is in fact validated science. Uh, and there is strategic, if I could put it that way, strategic science communication apart from, for want of a better word, public science communication. So this involves research institutions and business and government working together to understand each other's common, uh, common and, and different drivers. That's not what, we have not done that well in Australia. Uh, and I can think of a case study which I was involved with over the last four years. It was about the export of iron ore out of Australia, our, our major export. Uh, and it was potentially uh, at ports a bottleneck, I won't go into the detail, about the quality of the iron ore. Um, and this particular issue took three to four years to resolve at the International Maritime Organisation. I can tell you that um, the three iron ore majors, BHP, Rio Tinto and Valle from South America, put in substantial resources into this particular project. And there were 800 pages of peer-reviewed science delivered in one year. And it came down to five bullet points, which found their way into the International Maritime uh, Bulk Cargoes Code. So that cargo, I'll tell you it was a um, some cargoes, like iron ore fines, may contain a high proportion of fines, fine particulates, that may give them a propensity to liquefy in a vessel if that cargo is too moist 
What that could infer is that uh, a cargo could liquefy, you could lo lose a vessel, a capsize, and a tragic loss of life. That happened in India in 2009. Where are we now? We understand iron ore. We understand how to ship it safely. So that was a great example between a great example of industry, admittedly the three iron ore majors, and researchers, including CSIRO, I will add, um, and government, and that's the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, working together to deliver science into a regulatory space. I've had, um, I've been to the IMO in London a number of times. It's a political space. Um, and you get side comments along the lines of science is just another opinion. That's, that one has stayed with me for quite a long time. <laughs> and, and you think this is going to be a long day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sort of political space where we have to, to take our science. It can be done, and uh, I mentioned the Maritime Safety Authority in Canberra. Um, they were of the view that that 800 pages was the most substantive piece of validated science they had yet seen delivered into the IMO. And as I said before, it translated into five bullet points that meant that these iron ores can, could keep moving. So. Um, then I might come back to, uh, does Australia have any natural advantages? Rio Tinto is a global company and I get a lot of uh, response from um, my colleagues in, in other countries, in, the, in Europe and in the US. Um, they are, how can I put it, a little envious of what, what happens within Australia because we have access to government and access to world-class research facilities, but we haven't got our act together. And, to an extent, they marvel at why we haven't got our act together. Uh, I'm thinking of the EU. Um, I get responses from colleagues in the, in the company in the EU. What does the Australian government think of this particular um, problem? My response is, I don't know what Australia, you have to win the case on its merits. You need to do the science, Go to your, your regulatory authority, the competent authority, and win the, win the case on its merits. So uh, we don't have 28, we have six or, six or so states, we don't have 28 member states. So we have, what I'm getting at is an advantage. If you move in the EU, you have to take the other member states potentially with you. Yes, there's German uh, initiatives, as was referred to this morning, uh, but I think we're missing a big opportunity here, a big advantage. We haven't grabbed hold of it as well as we could at this point. So science communication, to me, needs to be done a lot better within Australia on all sorts of levels, is a key thing. And it must be with, uh, at that strategic level as well, with business, research institutions, and government. Thanks, okay. Peter, and I applaud your restraint in having got through that last message without mentioning the word agile. Um, <laughs> Jared, uh, we didn't manage to split the two Rio boys, but um, if, if hear from you, please. So look, I'm a, uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, I was a graduate of the University of New South Wales um, back when that university had a, um, a very strong uh, undergraduate um, generation of geoscientists. In fact, when I started work as a graduate with, uh, with Rio Tinto, about 30% of our graduate intake was from uh, University of New South Wales. Um, the piece of the company that I work for is the Exploration Group, um, and the piece of that um, entity that I look after now includes our research and development uh, portfolio. We don't have a large R&D uh, spend, but we do still uh, expend funds on research. Um, exploration is a combination, I suppose, of, of three, three sciences. It's geology, it's physics through geophysics, and it's chemistry through geochemistry. And it's only through the application of each of those sciences that we have any, any chance of, of making the next generation of uh, mineral discoveries that um, will turn into, into dollars for this country. In some senses, Australia faces a, um, a declining uh, rate of exploration success. So we know that resources are finite. Once you mine them, they're gone. Uh, you only get a chance to mine them once. Um, and when we look at the rate of discoveries in Australia over the last 20 or 30 years, we can see a very, very steady decline. The only way that we're going to arrest that decline is through innovation, is through the application of, of clever science, 
um, and working in partnership with uh, research institutions to develop the next generation of exploration technologies. Australia does have a very, very proud tradition and su uh, of success in this field and uh, we can continue to, to do that. The, some of you may, or I don't know whether you're aware of the Uncover Initiative, which is a CSIRO-led um, exercise now to bring together industry, um, government, and research institutions to set the next generation of priorities for uh, geoscience within this country. And it's a very, very good initiative, and, and we're quite hopeful. We're as involved in that as, as Rio Tinto as we can be. Uh, we're very hopeful that that will, will, take us, uh, to, will take us forward. We don't invest in research um, for altruistic reasons. We invest in research because, frankly, we want to get a return on that investment. Um, and the investment decisions that, that we make are primarily determined by whether we can see a pathway to, in my case, exploration success. So I'm not going to, to fund research proposals that um, we would see as, as purely academic. We have to be able to see a connection to, to, some, problems that, to some problems that we face. Um, some of our greatest failings in, in um, alliances or partnerships with institutions come about because we haven't actually articulated the problem. Um, a friend of mine said to me the other day, actually finding the answer is easy. It's actually articulating the problem um, is the area where we're falling over. And, and as an organisation, we have had many relationships, many partnerships with institutions around the world that are founded because we simply, um, we drifted apart uh, in terms of our objectives. We've had some very successful partnerships um, and we will continue to, to work with institutions. Um, and we both have to understand that although we have uh, somewhat perhaps different objectives, that the, the core uh, fundamental research science, I think, needs to be funded by government, and the application of that science and, and taking those, uh, those findings forward, that's where the alliance with business can come about. Um, you know, we faced at times with, with a challenge from an institution where we might want to do some particular piece of uh, analytical work because that institution has the best facilities in Australia or in the world. And yet, we'll, as an industry partner, we will be charged perhaps twice um, or three times the rates at which other organisations would be, would, be, would be charged. And he says, well, what does that do? That drives us to say, well, OK, if we're going to pay that amount of money, I'm going to own the answers. They're mine. I paid for them. I paid for them in you know, lots and lots of money. So I will own those, uh, those outcomes. And what that does then is, is not to drive a relationship with an institution. Um, we'll prevent publication because we own those outcomes. What's in it for the researcher? Well, you know, the answer will be not, not a lot. So we have to look for ways where we, can, where we can partner with institutions on a more collaborative basis. And I think for, a, for an organisation like mine, starting to, um, to understand more the impacts of wanting to own intellectual property, um, it's not so much what you know, it's how you apply what you know. And, and I think we're starting to understand as an organisation that you know, we, can, we can develop um, technologies with, with partners, but we will apply those technologies faster and better than anybody else, and we'll back our abilities to do that. And that should allow us to free up some of our concerns around owning the outcome. So I think there's a very healthy uh, relationship in place in this country. We have wonderful forums, the Amira program, in my case, which is joint, uh, joint funding, joint industry partners working with, with institutions. There have been great successes out of that, the Uncover Initiative, and we can do similar things, uh, similar things going forward. Both sides have to understand uh, each other's objectives uh, and work collaboratively, collaboratively, collaboratively together. Thanks very much. So, a great breadth of personal stories, but a bit of a theme about communication there. And look, so, to, in that light, let's uh, open it to questions from the floor. Uh, one thing we don't hear mentioned very much in Australia, I and mean, it's something that the Staff Association has campaigned on in the past, is science integrity. I think it's tied in with the communication issue, and, I, and, and we've often done it on the basis of trying not to politicise uh, scientific issues, but science integrity has broadened more recently, and there's a lot of concern about reproducibility, etc., around the world. So I was just throwing that back to you as some commentary on that and particularly maybe since we've talked about Germany 
Um, we could think of uh, Volkswagen as a, a good example of where they might be at with science integrity at the moment and, and should note also that I think Volkswagen is the, the biggest private R&D investor, about you know, $17 billion US a year. So, so any, any comments around science integrity on whether that's something we should bring into the debate here? I don't know who wants to go first on that, but I'm... I have to confess I have a um, diesel Volkswagen engine in my Audi that's uh, under scrutiny, so I'm, I'm happy to make a comment. I, I think um, when you have that clarity around the objectives and the goals and you have that follow-up and the governance, um, that's where the accountability lies. It, it's the follow-through and, and too often the science is left too open, if you like, without milestones or, or that follow-up to ensure that there is rigour and, and that people are delivering on what they've committed to deliver. And, you know, you see it's not just the Volkswagen um, issue, it's the Japanese uh, nuclear plants. That, for me, that was another one that really stood out where, you know, that, that reputation for the Japanese of, of having that science integrity fell over in that instance. And I think in the time that we're in where there is a lot of pressure on funding, there is a lot of pressure on resources, there is a risk that those science integrity issues will fall over and it, it, you know, it does mean that we have to be diligent, we have to also be funding that part of the process, otherwise we do open ourselves up for issues in the future and, and certainly coming out of the last 10 years, you know, there is a potential minefield of those issues that are yet to to come out because we've been cutting costs on resources, because we've been cutting costs on that governance side of delivery of science. So I think um, it's an area we need to shore up as opposed to um, just take for granted. I add too, I think um, <clears throat> we, there's been a number of comments today about the role of media in getting the message out and things like that. and. Um, and I think that scientists do themselves a disservice by continuing to focus almost entirely on the peer review process as the mechanism by which we establish quality in science. I think that um, you know, anybody who's sort of reasonably aware and have done a few papers or, or watched, for example, with interest the, um, the scam paper, uh, you know, scams that have happened in the last year or two, uh, or, or indeed looked at the, um, the big pharma studies of repeatability in technical papers, or even understand the very, very nature of science where discovery leads to an overturning of what's gone in the past. Every, we would all realise that, that just because a paper is peer-reviewed doesn't make it good. And yet, for a whole variety of other reasons, that becomes the, the metric you know, that, that we use in institutions. But unfortunately, the whole debate around technical or scientific uh, you know, topics in Australia becomes stifled when the media says, oh, it's peer reviewed, it must be right, I'll, I'll, I'll write it up. You know? and, and there's just not another level of thought goes into, well, actually, was it the correct experimental design for that particular problem? Or you, you know the whole other thing that goes with getting the science right, more so than getting it peer reviewed. Well, I must say that I'm clearly not smart enough to be able to be without integrity in my science because I don't know how to cover up and anything like that if I set out to achieve it. Peter, I think you had... Yes, um, I mentioned beyond compliance before. Um, that, that's an important area that uh, Australia, responsible business, I'll call it responsible business, has addressed and needs to address and continue to address. Uh, and um, I've often over... Um, I have to deal with smelter waste, mine wastes. We have to determine whether it should be landfill or should it be treated. Uh, I can assure you that I don't run a toxicology laboratory in, in Rio Tinto. I get that work done through CSIRO and so that when I go to our, talk to our competent authorities, probably in Canberra, they know that I will bring out that creditable, independent, third party review on the characteristics of that waste product. So that's an opportunity. Um, every year Rio Tinto says, well, would, would you like to work in the United States or somewhere else? No, I've always stayed here because I mentioned accessibility to government before, and, and I'll also mention accessibility to, to key research institutions. I know within Rio Tinto, in South Africa, 
and even in the US to an extent, they don't have the same access both to government and to quality research institutions, at least in the issues that we have to deal with. Thanks. Touch the nerve that one. We've got a question here. <laughs> I just want to raise the, um, the media and communication issue again. So, I, from my perspective, uh, as at the head of a, math, of a national maths organisation, I think our engagement with, the, with mainstream media is appalling. Um, and, I, and I think uh, we shouldn't just say, well, you know, who, who, reads the, who reads the paper anymore? Or it's not, it doesn't really matter whether kids uh, see that stuff or not. Um, I, I think uh, that simply when it comes to science communication, talking about putting on additional events or opening additional channels or whatever else really avoids the issue of proper engagement with the mainstream media. So by that I mean, I don't mean gee whiz science. I frankly think we're, we do ourselves a disservice by concentrating on gee whiz science. I think we avoid the deep intellectual issues that are associated with science around integrity, for example. And I do think this has a place in mainstream media. We're not nearly as engaged with them as people from the artistic and social sciences are, and I think we should be. And I think there's another thing to remember, a really key thing to remember, and it's something that Ian said this morning, Ian Chubb said this morning, about those hundred-odd maths, PhDs and honours students who uh, claimed they were there against the wishes of their parents. <laughs> And that is parents have, are the, the most significant, it's, not, it's well known uh, and well established that parents are the most significant determinants of early career choice and certainly subject choice in year nine. And it's parents who we have to educate about science and who we have to communicate with. And if the kids, are, the kids aren't going to go and get the content online, you know, without that buying from their parents. So I think engagement with mainstream media is important on so many different levels our, for our intellectual um, you know, to, to really identify ourselves clearly as intellectuals, as well as for science news, as well as for communicating the value and to science to parents. So if you have any comments about that, I'm not sure, but... Um, I initially thought that was very much a Brett question, um, but I also think we need to hear from the lead scientist of Victoria. Um, Brett, we might start with you. Yeah, look, um, I'm fortunate enough, enough to live with um, someone, my wife, teaches, maths teaches how to teach maths. Uh, she does online content as well as delivering PD. And, um, and she's come up from a science degree herself uh, and then an education degree. Um, and it's of great interest to me. In fact, I, another story, but I looked 18 months or so ago about getting out of what I'm doing and going back to teach maths and science. <coughs> you know, as I said, there's a whole other story there. But um, I think that uh, the parents, it's absolutely correct, but that's a generational thing. I, I tend to think that the people we have to most influence are, are the little kids. And I, I laughingly said that I grew up eating dirt and falling out of trees. And, and I grew up in a situation where it was okay to take risks. It was, uh, it was expected and encouraged. And uh, these days, one of the things that my wife is constantly telling me, did it just yesterday, gave another PD session, and a whole bunch of math teachers went, wow, I never realised that there was half a dozen ways to teach kids division, or place, or fractions, etc." cetera. There's, there's such a, a, so many people have a narrow um, exposure to risk taking, even for example, in an educational setting. And people need to understand that it's okay to, to be wrong this way, you can be right that way. And I think if we can get starting from the very earliest, some of it's parents and some of it's teachers, if we can get children uh, to learn to become resilient uh, in the face of, um, you know, there's not a right way to do this, or the world changes and we have to do it a different way tomorrow, that's going to be one of the greatest things that we can do in terms of education, the educational process? Obviously the generational change is real. I, I deal with um, Institute of Graduate Recruitment and, and managing graduate programs and it's so different now. The, 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 the approach that, that people have to, to career, to um, what I call security, job security, what's, what's more important is not, not maintaining a job, it's enjoying yourself. That's once you get them in. You know, all, all of us, you'll remember, I like to say to people, think, think about the best teacher you ever had. There's one or two, or maybe if you're really lucky, three teachers in your, in your whole career, in your whole schooling, 
and they were the ones that inspired you to do something, whether it was to be a better person or whether it was to work harder or whatever it was. You know, for me, it was a physics teacher, so I started off at university doing physics. Before, before that teacher, I didn't know what physics was. Um, and when I was at university, a, a geologist, an explorer, came and talked to us about what he did. And that's what set me off on, on the career that, that ultimately I followed. And I think all of us have an absolute role to play in terms of communicating to, to everybody, whether it's back at school talking to, to kids in year nine and year 10 about what you do. Why, why is being a scientist a really exciting and interesting thing to do? Because they don't hear it. Okay, so what's the stuff that they hear about being exciting? It's the stuff that's on, on YouTube. My kids talk to me about YouTubers. I didn't know what a YouTuber was <laughs> until I discovered that you can make millions and millions and millions of dollars doing nothing except making videos that you put on YouTube. So we have to, we have to get in front of people. We have to talk to people. We have to engage with the kids from whatever, whatever age they are about why science is good. And we have to help our teachers um, gear themselves up to be able to do that as well. They're the, they're the ones that are going to make the difference. And Leona, you certainly have some skid in this game. So. Yes, and, and I agree with, with Jeff. The, the science communication is so important and it's multidimensional, as, as Jared's saying. We have to get the messaging out that, um, that science careers are, you know, you can have great careers in science that are interesting, engaging and, and rewarding uh, and fun. You know, we, we were having this discussion last week at the Victoria Science Prize and I think there were a couple of um, very uh, uh, experienced scientists who decided they were going to sign up for the Comedy Channel next year and do some science skits just to, to try and communicate that science can be fun as well. But we do have an issue in communicating. It one, it's one thing building the skills of, of kids and getting that creativity and innovation in at an early age, but the challenge then comes at year 10 to, to 12 when you, know, you hear over and over that they get that creativity knocked out of them. And for girls particularly, and they'll do science all the way through their course and say, but I don't want a career in science. And it's that stereotyping, it's the role modelling, it's what Karen was saying, it's the biases when we continue to have panels which are predominantly all males or, or roles where there may be gender parity but there's not, the gender equity, but there's not gender parity with regards to that leadership voice. And so, you know, to get girls particularly engaged, we have to open up uh, those, break down those stereotypes and, and make it more interesting but we have to get to the parents and we have to get to the teachers to also you know, give them updates on what types of jobs are out there. And, and there's, I mean, it's evolving very quickly, as Karen Andrews said, and you can't say exactly what jobs are out there, but you can give them an indication. If you put up the, the growth centres for the federal government or the sector strategies for Victorian government or the global societal challenges that we're working on, it's a pretty good indication that if there's an occupation on, on any of one of those lists, there's going to be some jobs there in the future. And how do you get that messaging out in a simple but clear way across all levels, you know, to the students, to the parents, to the teachers and to the community? And we break down these stereotypes and try and communicate that science careers can be extremely rewarding. Uh, I want to take up a couple of points. One is that we can ask that mainstream media has more science, but the fact of the matter is the mainstream media, like other commercial organisations, are commercially based, and they will put on mainstream media what they think sells. So it's up to us to make them more saleable as far as um, the way we tell our stories of science, and the Australian Science Media Centre certainly does a very good job in making sure that a lot of science gets out to, ma to mainstream media that might not have been getting out there before. Um, but not all science gets out the mainstream media, which is why we've established Australia's Science Channel as to pick up the rest of the stuff that doesn't quite make it to the mainstream media to get out. And that is only from uh, appropriate institutions so that um, parents, teachers and the like, and I take, uh, I take Gerard's, point, Gerard's, Gerard's point, these things are only tools. These things are only tools for parents and teachers to use to have conversations. So yes, there are good YouTube channels. Yes, there are good communicators out there. But at the end of the day, um, we can produce Australia's Science Channel. Australia's Science Media Centre can put out as much uh, stuff through the mainstream media as they like, but unless people are having conversations, parents having conversations with their kids, um, employers having conversations with their employees, getting people out and about talking about these issues, then they're nothing more than tools that don't get used. So you need to use the tools that are there. There are reputable tools around, but they are just tools. And I think the, the point about 
having conversations can't be underestimated. There's no, nothing more powerful than a one-on-one -on -one or a face-to-face -face interaction, ever. There are quite a number of initiatives that encourage uh, universities and business to work together, but they do take some time and some effort to get started. Is there room for, dare I say it, a more agile system of funding those initial collaborations? Leonie, please. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting. We're going through a period where there is an incredible and overwhelming amount of goodwill from the private sector to help the education system to the point where I think, you know, it's, it's borderline of being a burden on the education system because everybody has got a mentoring program, an inter internship program. They're wanting to help teachers. They're wanting to do, and, and as has been evidenced by a number of speakers this morning, teachers are time poor. The curriculum is totally crowded. So how do you fit that all in? So, and you know, there are a number of organisations, mine included, has been mapping all of these initiatives. There are, are ones that overlap uh, and can be coordinated. The Cisco CSIRO is a good example where you can bring in and bring organisations together to develop, develop critical mass. And there are other areas where there are still gaps in, in providing that support and, and more in the primary area. So I do think it's time and there's a great opportunity to coordinate a lot of that goodwill, that funding and the in-kind support and try and get uh, in a bit more of a, uh, harness a, a bit more of that activity to see are we filling the gaps and are we putting too much pressure on the education system and is there a way that we can do this more effectively in the future to help the education system, which is what everybody is trying to do. And I just wonder whether somebody wants to comment more directly on, on doing research and, and, and seed funding that from business. Jared? We've Jared. had um, very successful partnerships in place, um, more broadly than, than my part of Rio, but, but Rio in particular with the University of Sydney here and the School of Field Robotics. Um, for, for many, many years, 2007 I think, uh, that partnership's been in place, it's just been extended again. And that's delivered a lot of value, direct and explicit value for us in terms of our um, mining automation program. But many times um, the partnerships founder, they don't work. And why don't they work? Well, probably because you end up with, you may have had aligned objectives to begin with, um, but misaligned objectives or the, the things drift apart. Um, I said before about, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And someone addressed, you know, the, the researchers might take the research down a particular pathway because that's what they're interested in rather than necessarily trying to solve the problem that you have. I'm not convinced that it's a problem of funding. Um, I think it is a problem of identifying capability and making sure that you can align your um, partnership with the institution that's going to give you the best results. Uh, we have a partnership in place with the University of Western Australia working on a, a gravity gradiometer project. Um, why there? Because the lead researcher was there. Uh, that's the only reason uh, we went there, it's with the School of Physics. Um, and, you know, fingers crossed, in the next year or two it'll be successful. Um, but I think it's, it's just as much about identifying where you need to go um, as, it, as it is about the money. In many senses, small, small pieces of individual research are not expensive. Um, PhD studies are not expensive. The issue with those is that they take a long time to deliver, um, and, and perhaps sometimes they never deliver. Um, we have, we have um, a number of PhDs that, that it's, it's the sort of thing that for me is just a low, it's a very cheap frankly, very cheap and generally successful uh, way to, to generate relationships with institutions. I, don't, I don't, really don't think it's a question so much of money from my perspective. It's about finding the right institution and getting that aligned set of objectives. And uh, no doubt that's engendered another bunch of questions, but unfortunately we're going to have to bring this discussion to an end here because it is time for lunch. We need to stick on our, on our timetable. And thank you very much. And, um, Thank my panel, please.